Well, thank you for joining us today on this oral history project around the Health Commons and the Department of Nursing at Oxford University. My name is Katie Clark. I am an assistant professor of nursing. Um, also with us, I have another faculty member. My name is Kaya Fruborg. I am also an assistant professor in the nursing department and current director of the BSN program. Great. And then for our interviewee. Can you please introduce yourself for the recording? Ruth Ennestvet. Great. And can you tell us your title when you were here at Oxford? Oh, I was an assistant professor of nursing. Great. Good. And we're going to come back, as requested by Dr. Ennestvet, to um, go over the consent at the end. Change things up a bit. Good. Good. Thank you. All right, well, to get us started, can you just tell us a little bit about you? For example, where were you born and who did you call family? I was born in northwestern Minnesota in a rural community. I lived on a farm in my childhood. Um, and it was post-war, so it was a dramatic change from rural culture to focus on moving into the urban environment in order to assimilate this immigrant family. So I went to college, but was just the second person in the family to go to college. My older brother did, but he got recruited for football, so it was no big deal for him to apply and think about who before me went to college. I thought I wouldn't get into college because I couldn't put on the form that I had any family members who'd gone to college. So we made up something about Uncle Gummy teaching it. <laughs> At Gustavus. <laughs> well, it really wasn't made up. <laughs> but anyway, I got into college, and my mother, who was a nurse, and I, one of the things she wanted to know was something about why nursing. And my mother was a nurse, and I was always interested in how she was respected when anybody was sick, and she could talk to the the uh, medical people and I could understand what they were talking about. But I had aunts who were nurses and at that time you were a nurse or you were a teacher. And um, thank, thanks to my mother, she said, if you're gonna be a nurse, you're not going to a training program, you're gonna go to a college. So about a you know month before final applications were due, I started to apply. <laughs> um, and ended up going to St. Olaf for my first educational experience. So I thought from there that I really wanted to work in a hospital. I wanted to work in a high-powered hospital. Mm -hmm. So I went out to Mass General in Boston thinking this is a high-powered hospital. And I was in an orientation program with nurses from the University of Michigan. How uh, They were high-powered nurses. Mm -hmm. This was a whole different um, whole different background of education from what I had at St. Olaf. But they went into the middle, upper middle class part of Mass General, which it was at that time, probably still is, the most expensive private hospital in the country, even though it's called a general hospital. Well, I went to the so-called welfare part of the hospital, which was a part of, um, I was on the National Historic Register. <clears throat> and I found that although it wasn't the high-powered medical place, it was really interesting for the diversity of the patients who came there. We got people from South Boston, so we had a lot of Irish from South Boston, Italians. We had a lot of people from different backgrounds, and they were primarily low-income, of course, because this was the welfare part of the hospital. And I found myself being intrigued by this diversity. But what I couldn't stand about the hospital setting was the gender politics and the idea that I was supposed to do what the doctors ordered. And I recall, for example, being told that I was to, at that time, all the guys in the ward, it was an open ward, were smoking. If they wanted to smoke, they could smoke. A guy with liver problems, a doctor wrote on the chart, no smoking. <clears throat> I looked at the chart, the head nurse said, you need to tell him he can't smoke. I said, if the doctor doesn't want him to smoke, he can tell him. So, I, needless to say, I was not a popular person there. But I lasted. I lasted because I was too scared to work in Roxbury. I really would have liked community health, but, you know, 
a white girl from the rural community. I just didn't have the street whatever to do that. And I'm sorry now because it would have been fascinating. So anyway, I came back to Minnesota, worked in community health. Saw that a lot of the things that we considered crises as nurses were kind of daily life for the people we were working with. That there's something wrong here. We are really, you know, we, we really don't know how to intervene in these situations. So I thought, um, ah, more education, that'll do it for me. So I got a master's degree at the University of Minnesota in, the, in public health, thinking, now I'll really learn how to intervene and really help people. The one thing I knew when I went to that master's program was I did not want to teach. I knew that for sure. So after I got done with the program, one of my friends who was teaching at the university asked me if I would come and teach there. <laughs> so that's where I started teaching in community health and found that it was a lot of fun, especially because I was teaching in clinical settings and you know that's what I really liked. Um, well, along came children and I dropped out of nursing for a while and had a friend working at the Humphrey Institute in a research project and she asked me if I wouldn't come and take do the nursing part of this research project. It was a federal, federally funded um, grant looking at home care and nursing home care for the elderly. And um, I, I learned some interesting things there. Number one, we were on that grant for at least two years without any identified objectives. And they kept getting funded and funded and funded. I thought, this is strange. How does this work? I didn't know you could get funds and keep getting funds. Well, it turns out the people who are running the program had a lot of connections in Washington. That's how it's done. I learned one little thing about how that federal funding actually works. Anyway, so I worked there for a while and decided that was coming to an end. So I went back to the School of Nursing at the University of Minnesota. And um, there was a lot of pressure then to get a PhD if you were going to teach at the university. So uh, a couple of friends and I decided we better go ahead and do that. I had no, absolutely no interest in doing data-focused research. I had no interest in hypotheses generation. Even though as an undergraduate, I had studied nursing research with a friend. In January, we had, on interim, we went out to Washington, D.C., just wrote letters to people and who were in leading the research work in nursing and said, we want to come and talk to you. They set up appointments, we went out to Washington, we, <laughs> we met with the people out there who were really leaders in nursing research at the time. And it was interesting to me, but here was an, one of the ironies of my nursing career. I thought I wanted to be an expert in something because I wanted to be sought out as an expert. And as you guys know, one of the things that I have come to at the end of my career was expert is the wrong perspective to take. You can be an expert if you're going to sit in a room among experts and compete about who's got the most, you know, to say about the poor, the disadvantaged, the people who are homeless. Then you can be an expert, but only with those kind of experts. So, um, let's see, where was I? I'm going to get sidetracked. Something you can edit out of this. No, it's fine. I, okay, so I got my master's degree. I was teaching, and I pressure to get a PhD, and I didn't want to do hypothesis tests. I just didn't want that kind of research at all, but I was really interested in doing qualitative research. I have always been curious about how other people live their lives, how they solve their problems, what kind of things they encounter and where they came from, what they think about. So it just seemed like a natural that I would choose anthropology. It had a whole different kind of process of um, scholarship, of learning, um, so that's what I did. And it took me a while to kind of get sorted in that department with who was going to be the right people to work with. And I always felt kind of marginalized because I didn't come through there. I didn't get a master's degree in anthropology. I was coming from a side, you know, um, department. But I kept at it, worked at it. It took me a long time. But I didn't feel bad for how long it took me because it only took me a couple of years longer than the average length of time it takes to get a PhD in anthropology. And meantime, I had a full-time job at the university. I had a part-time job with Hennepin County. I was raising two kids. You know, the, you know the story. It's kind of the typical woman's story, right? 
So it took me a little bit longer to get the PhD. And finally, it was kind of like do or die. And I decided, well, I want to do the PhD, but I could give a crap about the University of Minnesota. So I said, I'm leaving here, goodbye. And thank you for the education because they paid my way in the PhD program. Um, but I gave them a lot too. But at that time, what I really enjoyed with my friends, I had two good friends in the community health department and we worked with the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs at the Humphrey Institute and developed what we called the High Rise Project. And at the time we were doing the High Rise Project, we heard about Bev Nielsen starting a nursing center at, um, at Central Lutheran. We were straightforward about we're really not so much helping people as we're exchanging some experience in community work, community health, with people uh, who, and for that, the students are getting this experience, and however we can help in this community, we will help. And the fun thing was, people weren't so interested in having health intervention. They were more interested in making Halloween things or having some kind of coffee, things like that, that seemed to the students, of course, like totally not nursing. But it struck me that, of course, this is nursing. Because what we are really doing here is helping to create a community with, in a place where there's a lot of mistrust, a lot of fear. It was at a time when, thanks to Reagan, the money was going out of public housing and going into senior housing, privately developed senior housing. So of course, and, and so what happened was the housing got emptied and in moved the guys from the Rust Belt who were out of jobs. And Minnesota was, Minneapolis was a great new area, fertile field for the drug trade, so people started moving in to public housing. And at that time, the only, that's, if you weren't over 65, you had to be disabled. Well, disabled meant you were addicted. So, or you were mentally ill, one or the other. So it became kind of a frightening environment for people who were living there. But it also became a lot more fascinating in a way. So I ended up doing my research there, my dissertation research, and found it to, I probably heard many stories about this before, but found that to be really interesting. Really, I, I have always found the diversity, you know, interesting. But also to see just the kind of cultural dynamics among the poor. I remember, for example, one guy saying to me, great, diversity. You can sit somewhere and talk about how we need to have diversity here. Have you ever really lived in diversity? And you know, when people are scrambling for scarce resources, diversity looks a lot different, I think, you know? So anyway, they taught me a whole lot about how you, how you get along when things are very scarce and you have used up all your money on pull tabs after the first week. You know, what do you do? How do you get along? So there I am. So can you tell us a little bit more about what your dissertation was? Yeah, my dissertation was about uh, it was a, a critical medical anthropology focus, looking at um, control and resistance to, or no, resistance to professional control among low-income elderly women. And what, what did you do for that project? I talked with the elderly women in the public housing, spent a lot of time in the public housing, just hanging out there and seeing what the social dynamics were, spent a lot of time talking to a lot of different people in the building, had um, some experiences where I really blew it. I remember a woman who I had a really good relationship with. She was really a sharp little lady, and she had called the um, security guard one night. And she was telling me this story that she'd called the security guard who, to tell her that you know somebody had tried to break into her apartment. And the security guard didn't do anything, didn't even come up. So Miss Intervention, Miss Solve the Problem, I was gonna go and talk to the security guard and make sure that this didn't happen again. So I went and talked to the security guard 
who was like the elderly woman, an African American. The next time I came into the public housing setting, the elderly woman was downstairs waiting for me and she just ripped into me. I had crossed a line. As a white woman, I do not interfere with her, her situation when it's another black woman. Keep my nose out of her business. It was like, whoa, okay, I get it. You know, and I had another man, I naively said, I, I will help you get to the doctor. I'd be glad to give you a ride, thinking, you know, this would be real helpful to you. And he looked at me. It was an elderly African-American gentleman. He looked at me and said, you have no idea how much trouble I could get into if I was seen with you. Yeah. Whoa, okay. There is a whole lot behind this that I don't have a clue about. But, you know, I developed a lot of trust with people. And I could, you know, at one time tell this, really, this ex-gang member who's just really a big guy could be really intimidating. And he said, he came into where I was one day, and he said, so, he said, you know, I was walking home last night, and a couple of young guys pulled a gun on me. He, I said, so what would you do? He said, well, I looked at him, and I said, you could shoot me, but you'd end up in in pen and I'm telling you that would be a, a really bad life for you <clears throat> and I said so what happened he said so they walked away I said well you probably looked like somebody who knew what they were talking about from experience he said yeah I did I said so what was it like being in a gang he said terrifying I was scared all the time well you know this is I, I was always amazed that people would tell me things like this and of course who knows how <laughs> you know, they said, you know, here's this little white girl who, you know, what does she know? <laughs> Just <laughs> feel her full. But nevertheless, there were, you know, you can tell when people, I can tell, I think, a little bit when people are being honest. So anyway, it was quite a great experience, and the dissertation research ended up to be quite fascinating. In fact, two of my readers said they actually read it. <laughs> 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 You're not supposed to make us laugh. <laughs> um, so if anybody were to want to read your dissertation, is it anywhere publicly available? Well, the dissertation abstracts at the University of Michigan. It's there. Um, and then one question, just going back to your teaching at the U, what did it look like when you taught community health in that time? Well, the the classic... The classic way to teach community health was to have lectures, and then you would have clinicals. And the clinicals were to go and sit in an, an agency while you, the nurses took care of the students. You know, they took them out on their visits, and they took them to, well, really, you know, to people who would agree to have students along. That was how it was taught. And at the same time, this was supposed to be community-centered nursing. It was supposed to be community health. And what they were getting was seeing individuals in their home, which isn't, to me, much of a community. You, get, you certainly get a flavor of things that different from the hospital. But we felt, my friends and I, this is not community. We really need to go into a community and try to see what some of the dynamics are that are at work, that are affecting people and influencing them. We had a fight on our hands with the faculty who were not us, the rest of the faculty, who just wanted to do the traditional public health. They will never be able to pass their public health. This isn't really public health, hand-wringing and hand-wringing. So we would get people on our sides like, you know, the Humphrey Institute or the president of the university. Or we went to, we were so naive, we went down to the, and there was a, the assistant of the mayor, she was just a dynamic woman. Uh, Don Fraser was the mayor at that time. And this woman was just dynamite. And we would go to her and she'd say, well, come and talk to this. We have this committee on poverty or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Let's come and talk to them. Tell them what you're doing. So we went to them and we said, you know, this is what we're doing. They said, how much money do you want? <laughs> they, oh, oh, okay. Well, you know, we could probably... I don't know, a couple thousand dollars. So they gave us a couple thousand dollars. And we came back to them then with a report about what we had done, what we had happened with them. And they said, whoa, we don't often get feedback like this. How much more money do you need? We were just, we had no clue how we could have really had a lot more influence than we did. 
So we, you know, we carried on like that, and it was really a, I think it was a very good project. But when we left, nobody in the faculty wanted to go out into the community and actually practice. Uh-uh. They wanted to sit in the agency and let the nurses take the students out. So it just ended. So then thank goodness for the Health Commons for the nursing center. <laughs> well, yeah, so you mentioned the High Rise Project, and that's when you learned about Bev Nielsen's work in the mm-hmm. Health Commons. So mm-hmm. how did you end up? at Augsburg then? Well, I got a PhD in anthropology partly to get out of nursing because I really couldn't. I'd had no good experiences really in nursing. Um, community health was the closest thing to making use of what I, of my education, but I didn't feel like it was really relevant for the people I was dealing with, even though I felt more comfortable in it. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll just get out of nursing. Maybe I'll just do the anthropology PhD and see where that takes me. Well, it wasn't a good time to get employed in universities, which was about the only place you could go, you know, with that kind of a degree. So hearing about the transcultural nursing program beginning at Augsburg, I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. Why don't I try that? And Cheryl Looning and I had taught together at the university she came into the high risk project as a new person on the faculty and got it right now she got it and she took a group of students into a public housing and did a fantastic job so we had worked together there and i knew she was at augsburg too so that kind of got me there and i remember my interview with bev and she said to me so what's your theory of nursing Oh, no. (laughs) Uh, So I said, oh, I think my theory of nursing is supporting autonomy through relationships. Well, Bev got onto that very well. She could figure out I didn't have to put a theorist's name to it, you know. She agreed with it. So I came to Augsburg. And what year was that? 1999. And... Was it just the BSN completion program then, or had the master's program started? Cheryl and Bev had started one course. I think it was maybe the, I don't know, whatever 500 is now. And they were teaching it as an immersion, a weekend (coughs) immersion, Friday night, Saturday, in Sioux Falls, I think. And people like Deb Schumacher and... um, There were a couple of people who drove to Sioux Falls for the weekend to take this course in transcultural nursing. And um, so uh, since that was underway, and I started teaching, the first course I taught was the BSN research course in Rochester. And it was just at the time that the Rochester program was starting. And there was a lot of discord at the college about being forced to teach down in Rochester. And one of the tenured faculty members here at Augsburg had been teaching research and she refused to go down to Rochester to teach. So I said, okay, I'll go down to Rochester to teach that course. She didn't want to have anything to do with me teaching that course. She taught her course, I taught my course. And it was a disaster. <laughs> I'm sure it was probably some of the worst teaching evaluations I've ever gotten in my life. I didn't look at my own thing. <laughs> so I got out of that, thankfully, and into developing courses in the master's program. Uh, so how, do you know much about how the program began at all, or not really? Well, um, there was the early, the early days of, you know, the, this... I believe Augsburg was focused on an education, um, on quality education for working people, you know, people who couldn't afford other private colleges. And I think they started out with the ministry, that's where they started as a seminary. And then I think one of the next um, focuses was on education and business was in there, I think, somewhere. And then the next one was nursing. And they had a relationship with, with um, Deaconess, Lutheran Deaconess Hospital, and maybe Martha 
you know, talked about this. And there was clearly an early, early arrangement with Lutheran Deaconess to have the science courses taught here um, for the their nursing students, which is, a, you know, a nursing program, if you ask me. It's connected to the college. Um, the BSN program, I recall there was... Um, What year might it have been? I was just probably back teaching at the university, so it maybe it was in the 70s. Probably Bev Nielsen was starting this um, completion program. It was just the beginning of completion programs in the state. Um, I don't know, maybe it was the 80s. Somebody from my graduate program started one up in Moorhead. <clears throat> anyway. So there was this completion program and starting here. And then as far as the transcultural nursing emphasis, I know you just mentioned that Bev and Cheryl were, you know, kind of starting the MAN program at that time, but do you know how it was kind of decided upon that that would be the focus of the MAN, the transcultural nursing? Uh, I think that's what Bev and Cheryl wanted to do. I just didn't know if, like, I'm trying to think even through Leininger and when she came out with, you should know, Kaya, oh, well, when her theory came about. In the and, 60s. Oh, 60s. Yeah. Well, Cheryl had, Cheryl had been, she had a degree in transcultural nursing, so she had already been connected to Leininger. <clears throat> but we started, we started the program before it was accredited. Well, we still had about, oh, I don't know, three or four courses to develop. Mm -hmm. And before those courses were even developed, we were being accredited. It was just a kind of a bizarre situation. Mm -hmm. And I know because I was the interim chair at the time, mm -hmm. and it was madness. <laughs> How did a small group of women not only run the department, but create many different programs and tracks? How did you manage all of this? You know, I think there was, Cheryl was the chair. Well, before that, Bev, of course. And Bev was somebody who was very uh, creative, very open to ideas. She was very frugal, money-wise, and was not so interested in reaching out into national spheres. But when Cheryl came on, Cheryl was really interested in connecting nationally. And she was not as frugal as Bev. And Cheryl was just, if well, you have an idea, try it out. I mean, it was really, it has always been, I think, a department like that. Mm -hmm. at least in my experience, okay, try it, see what happens, go ahead. And that made it a, and it was always supported, that kind of creative work. Well, yeah, and I think many of the nursing faculty at that time, and even until just a few years ago, were in a non-tenure track. And mm -hmm. now there's kind of this shift to move towards a tenure track as a department. Why do you think that shift came about? Do you have any idea? Well, I think it changed as the college changed, you know. The college became more formalized in um, who can, who needs to be reviewed, what does review have to look like. If you're in non-tenure track and you have to go through the same thing practically that tenure track people do, why not get tenured, you know. Um, Cheryl came here. I mean, there was some petty stuff that happened. Cheryl came here as a tenured professor from Augustana, and they would not give her a tenured professor position. She, they would give her a professor, but she had to go on an expedited track to tenure, which was just BS. It was really cheap, cheap stuff. And I think one of the things that the nursing department fought against was this belittling, this dismissive attitude that nurses, I think, have always faced. You know, not being taken seriously, not really listened to, being kind of marginalized as a, you know, you girls go and do what you want to do. You know, this 
touchy feely stuff. Go ahead, you know. And so uh, when we got this graduate program going, it was it took a long time. And I don't know if it's even still completely divorced from the idea that this graduate program was a Rochester program. And I have no idea why they wanted it to be just a Rochester program. But there was a, it took a long time to kind of get the, and I don't know if Joyce is still fighting it or not, Cheryl fought it the whole time. This is one program. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's, that's a financial thing. And I and but they they there's this mystifying. Well, um, how many years did you work at Augsburg Total? In ninety nine to when did I finally retire? <laughs> I it must have been about fifteen sixteen years, probably fifteen years full time. And what really kept you here all those years? Oh, the the relationships with the faculty, the students, the opportunity for the intellectual stimulation creating stuff all the time. It was so much fun. I mean, I created a lot of courses. I created a lot of immersions. And it was just a lot of fun. How did you, I believe that you were the first one to set up the Guatemala immersion. I was. Uh -huh. How did that come about? Oh, <laughs> that Cheryl uh, was at, I think, the Peace Prize Forum, sitting next to a big donor. And... Um, one of, um, oh, I just blank on his name. He was head of the, oh, and maybe it will come to me. Anyway, she was sitting next to this big donor, and they were talking about Guatemala and San Lucas, and this donor said, you know, I really think it would be good if there could be some nursing involvement in the, San Lucas at the mission and so you know we'll we'll fund some nurses to go down there okay so there were some the first the first trip down there I think Sue and I went down there like just for a couple of days just to kind of scope it out meet Fidel kind of see what we were going to do and then we brought a group of nurses and the nurses got it paid for by this donor mm -hmm. it was a pledge the donor never came through. Oh. Her husband got really sick, and she started begging for money. So <laughs> it was kind of an unfortunate thing that happened because that could have been a really helpful thing for more students to go. Um, but once it got st and and it, at first, the we we took graduate students and then the next year undergraduate students went and then the next year it was there weren't as many students interested in it and it just kind of felt like this should be an every other year thing to me um, and not an undergraduate thing you know it just it's, it's my bias that I think these immersion experiences are for the cost and for the time to set it up I think graduate students do a better job of taking advantage of it and getting into it. Can I ask a question? Of course. So it seems like I'm, I'm feeling that there's this over, like overwhelming theme of like um, innovation on your part with little resources, little money, little support. What kind of advice would you give um, either faculty or nurses in, in order to get things done without always necessarily having the help to do so? Hmm. Well, I think I think the the small size of the faculty and the close relationships. There's a lot of support. At least there was, you know, mm -hmm. where people really backed each other up and did their job. We had a couple of people who were here who didn't do their job, didn't do their part, and they're no longer here, which was just fine. And we had some bad experiences with some tenure track people who didn't do the work, you know, didn't show up. So. Um, I think that was another element relative to the tenure track for not doing you know I, I I kind of worry about going to university status in a way because just as my friend at the university said when we they went to a doctoral program every lower pro it becomes a real status thing and then the lower programs get less 
respect, less resources, you know, it just doesn't seem to get spread around as equally. So I don't know. When it was small, when it, you know, I served on the Senate and I was not, I was neither in a tenure track nor an associate professor even. And I can remember being asked to be on some regents committee and I said, I can't be, I'm not an associate professor. And people on the Senate were, what? You're not an associate professor. No, I'm not. You know, so you could participate without having to be in a kind of box of a certain kind of, and that helps in a way because you get access to people and, you know, and to things, other things at the college. Mm. I don't know. I, I, it's a, it's a very interesting question because I think a lot was done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a point at which the joke was, do, do we, do we need to pay Augsburg now? You know, because we were, <laughs> we didn't feel like we were getting paid for all the time we were putting in. But there were other things about it that kept us going. Well, on to a different topic, mm -hmm. but so when did your work at the Health Commons, which was then called the Nursing Center, mm -hmm. when did that when did that start? The same year that I became interim chair, started the immersion in Mexico. We had the accreditation for the master's program. It was a busy year. <laughs> and what did it look like when you first started? I, um, it was one long room that looked a little bit clinic-y. It had dividing, it had, it had an exam table, it had uh, medicine things, it had uh, curtains to draw, and it had a desk where people had came to ask for help from the nurse. They had to have a problem they needed help with. But it was clear that most people were coming for socks. So we would run from the desk back to the hole behind the curtain and get socks. Back to the curtain and get socks. Back to the curtain and get socks. And we thought, this is a little silly. <laughs> Why don't we just have socks to hand out? So we moved the socks up to the front. But we also had pharmacy vouchers. We had, there was a deal with Walgreens Pharmacy and we would, people would come and this was brilliant. We, we, would, we couldn't diagnose, right? So on this voucher we would just write what people told us. This is what they say is their problem or this is what they say they need. And they would take this voucher to Walgreens, look for something themselves or ask the pharmacist. Well, that was running into a lot of money. People were using them to shop, you know, and so we decided that this isn't working so well. Plus, Walgreens closed, and we couldn't find another resource to connect to it. So, you know, there was still in our, the mind that they were going to hire a permanent person here to do health promotion. Health promotion, health education was the beginning, I think, of the nursing center. Well, I'm not a big believer in health education. <clears throat> I, and health promotion is kind of still an expert model. So it just didn't seem to be something that was working here. And I think, well, we got the, we got the mail room for a little quiet place. So we put some, a recliner and some other comfortable chairs and a, you know, subdued lighting in there and would offer that as a place for people to sleep if they'd been walking the streets all night and they seemed really anxious or they needed just a place to be quiet by themselves. We tried some other little things that didn't really work too well. So um, I think it, it just sort of gradually moved away from, you've got to come with a problem, but what you really want are these other things that you really need to, but let's just start there instead of starting with, you have to come in here and make up something or ask for something, you know. What do you know about um, the beginnings of the nursing center? Well, like I said, I think it was focused on, I think it was focused on maternal and child health, health promotion, things, and the idea that there was a part-time director or clinician who was there. I think there used to be white coats hanging in the closet, so I think they were wearing white coats, and you know, it really was more of a medical clinical mo clinic model. And, uh, <clears throat> 
yet um, I know that at one point there was so much money sitting in the account, just sitting in the account. And it, we had shifted to bringing, getting stuff for people because that's what they were looking for, they were needing. And here was all this money. So <laughs> this became a, a big discussion point at meetings of the um, advisory committee. What are you doing spending the money? What are we doing keeping the money? What are we saving it for? Why are you spending it? What? Well, what's it for? If it isn't for need, and here's need right in front of our eyes. So, um, so that kind of started to shift. But I think the rainy day um, security pot was for the idea that they were going to have a full-time practice person there or a half-time practice person. They needed to have some money to pay that person. But that didn't really seem to make sense because this, this was becoming more and more integrated as an educational experience as well. So, mm -hmm. so since the beginning, or since you started at the Health Commons, what's changed the most since the last time you were there? Since the last time I was there? Yeah. I don't know. Since the last time I was there, I haven't been there. <laughs> well, what's changed the most from the time you started Seven. until the time you retired? Um, I, I think the space and the name opened up a whole new kind of view of what it is could be done and what was happening there. I think your Katie's efforts to open get that room and open it up and make it you know uh, much more inviting um, to make it uh, to make it work for what we were actually doing now, which was inviting people in to get these supplies and to have another space that was welcoming and uh, relaxing for people to talk with nurses and I think more and more student experience has become a part of the um, <clears throat> part of the health commons I think going from the term nursing center to health commons was a real shift that opened things up because then people didn't have to feel like well you're what are you doing here are you doing medicine here? Are you diagnosing people? Are you treating people? Is this legal or illegal? What we had, we'd have a doctor from the congregation come down on Sunday mornings when we were in the nursing center and say, what are you doing here? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and so that kind of dissipated, just like in the neighborhood here in Cedar Riverside when we came up with the commons name, suddenly all of the territorial you know, stuff just evaporated. Mm -hmm. We aren't competing with you. We are not a health provider. How can you provide health anyway, I'd like to know. You know? So what we're doing is creating a different opportunity for people. And what do you remember around the events for Change the Name? Well, I remember we were working with Sara, mm -hmm. you know, and working at the, in the Cedar Riverside, working on uh, trying to get some sense of what the neighborhood would accept. And Sarah was going to people and getting the feedback of, we don't want nurses here. You know, we don't need nurses here. If you come as a nurse, you're going to either be suspected or you're going to be um, dismissed because you're not a doctor. So that's not gonna work. So I, I think when we came up with the idea of let's do a health, let's just call it a health commons. That was just gone. So as far as nurses and being skilled at certain things, how do you think nurses can really think about creating a welcoming space when they're at the health commons? Well, I think it's a great shift. And it's a kind of shift that can only happen if you're there a few times. I think the first time you're there, I think there's sort of a culture shock that happens where people just could think, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do? What's going on here? This doesn't feel like anything. I have no role. What you know, this isn't this is just so loose and so ambiguous and there's just really nothing happening here. And I mean just the constant 
pressure to show evidence of, you know, impact, effect, you know, is part of this whole view that somehow this is a, a health care process, you know? And when I heard, when I heard before, before of the, the Obama health care initiative, when I heard I'm just no good with names, but the person who's now working with the uh, state health department say, you know, we just don't need to talk about healthcare systems anymore. Putting money into that system is just a black hole, and I think we've seen that. It is just a black hole. If we want to talk about health, we've got to talk about something different from health care. You know, so I think what the what the health commons does is open up an opportunity to see, well, what is it? What makes for this kind of experience that can be health producing or an opportunity for health? And I think just the fact that students will come and when they're leaving kind of say, well, that was really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Is it healthy to have fun? Does that give you a different experience, a different kind of fulfillment, a different opportunity to really find humanity? And then when we had somebody come who was from, um, he was from Iraq, and he was part of the health ministry from Iraq, and he came as part of the University of Minnesota. He wanted to find out, well, what was his place? You know what? And so we explained it. We gave him curriculum. We showed him everything written and talked to him. And finally he got done. He said, ah, he said, this is a humanitarian project. And I said, yes, that's what it is. It's humanitarian. And what better thing should it be? What more complete, more holistic could it be mm -hmm. than humanitarian? So, so I think how do students learn that? You know? Well, yeah, and get to the, getting to the stu student learning, all those years you spent at the Health Commons, how did you feel their, their um, education was transformational or helped them shift from being at the Health Commons? What was kind of your experience on how we got to our student outcomes that we wanted because of being at the Health Commons? Well... <clears throat> I, I think students who wanted to come back, I think, was a clear indication that this was something that was was providing something missing that they wanted to experience. But I remember, too, especially what comes to mind as you ask that question, is a guy who worked at Hennepin County, I think, in ER, I think. It was either an ER or a mental health unit, psychiatric unit. And when he came, you know, it was sort of like, oh, I know this one. I, this is not, there's nothing new here to me. And so, you know, you say, well, good, you can really help us out then and, you know, give us some ideas about how this works. And, you know, in other words, respecting what they already come with, I think. And, and um, not, not the, as I'm thinking, but not saying, oh, wrong attitude. You don't come here thinking you know it all. You got, that's not, instead of that, just to say, well, good, you can help us then, you know. Well, then he was not feeling defensive. He didn't feel like he had to be showing his knowledge so much. And by the end of it, he was really impressed with what was happening to people that he hadn't known about. Because when you're obviously in a hospital setting, you're not talking to people about what's really happening to you mm -hmm. in the street. And it's, it's a dangerous place for you to say too much in a way. Well, I mean, it's, it's a great generalization about the hospital. But so he, he, even though he thought he knew and had had experience with the population, he could, at the end of the, just one experience, say this was, this was very enlightening. I learned a lot here and could be specific about it. I think there's been discussion at the college level or university now around is being in a faculty role at the Health Commons considered service or is it considered scholarship or is it considered teaching? So what's your viewpoint on that? Well, I think the way you handle it, Katie, makes it service because it was always a surprise to me when I was at the University of Minnesota when I learned that service was not service in the community. I 
thought we were doing this high rise project was great service. I thought, holy smokes, look at this. We've got the help. We've got the city council behind us, and the president of the university comes out and uses us as an example of the community, the university, and the community. This is service. Wrong. Service in a in a tenure position is service to the college. What committees are you on? What have you done to help? You know, with with um, serve on different task forces, it is isn't service in the community. Now, you have been able to bridge that gap, I think, by your work to bring faculty to the health commons, to bring students who aren't nursing students to the health commons, to bring the president's students to the health commons. That begins to look like a college that wants to be serving the community needs to think about service differently. But I would guess that when you're in your tenure work with, and it's work, with the uh, committees, you're going to have to fight for the idea that this is in fact legitimate service because they're going to think, well, what committees have you been on? You know, what have you done here for the college? So I think it's a great, I think you have, you have, are on the way to doing something very important about that. And of course, your work with Harry Boyd and, you know, um, Don, whatever it is. is. So back to more about um, the Health Commons. Mm -hmm. So how do you acknowledge the need when you're at the Health Commons? What, are, what should nurses be doing to acknowledge that need? How do you see that first stage being met? Well, I think that first stage is, you know, just being open with what do you, what stuff do you need, you know? And I think one of the things you had asked about was a model, and I'll just say it right here, that the model really got the first, the first efforts at this model for the health commons was, it was stimulated by this constant or ongoing discussion between Linda and I, who were co-coordinators um, co of the nursing center at that time. Linda thought we shouldn't be spending so much money on stuff. We should, she thought it was really, really dehumanizing for people to stand in line for this stuff. And that we shouldn't really have this stuff because it was, as a result, it was creating this kind of just demoralizing, humiliating experience for people. Well, she has a point. I think there's 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 truth in that, you know? But the fact is still there that people are lining up for this stuff. So what do we say? Because we are too sensitive to do this, we wouldn't have it for them? I mean, so we would go around and around about this. Jeff, yeah, well, it's too expensive. Well, we've got money. Yes, I know what we need to say. No, we just go around and around and say, okay, I've got to kind of formulate what's going on here. That was humanizing. That humanized people who they had been taught in many, many places, not the least of which were their family members saying, oh, you can't go there, it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. These are people, and they're kind people, they're grateful people, they don't even look crazy, you know? So that, I think, was a great thing in itself. So from there, you know, I think just to have things that you, if you, you have to use your imagination a little bit, right? So if you're a woman on the streets, what would you need? If you're a woman with a baby, what would you need? Well, you certainly need pads, that's for sure. Where are you gonna get that? You, I mean, that's expensive stuff. You need diapers, that's expensive stuff. So just a little imagination. If people are on their feet all the time, what do they need? I mean, just, Think about what could just be there and offered. I think students, especially their first time, often struggle with how do you engage around um, where you uh, tend to the struggle. How do you tend to the struggle? Yeah, in a way that gets out of the expert model. They really mm -hmm. struggle with that. So mm -hmm. what advice mm -hmm. would you give students or nurses practicing at the health commons around that? Well. Like I have hammered many times, don't ask questions. You're not doing an assessment here. You are not diagnosing what the struggle is. You are, you're responding 
giving feedback in a way that elicits more, more about the struggle. So you are getting a physical complaint, and that's real. You have to pay attention to it. But it is not the whole problem. It is just the surface. It is the mediator, sort of, of the problem. They can bring this symptom to you and they can engage with you. And believe me, when they're engaging with you, they are checking you out, you know? So don't think that you're not on some kind of assessment, <laughs> in some kind of assessment, but you are. So they are, they're looking for, do you really care? Do you want to know? Is there anything more? Or do you just really want to check out what this blood pressure is? Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is say something positive to them, a comment that is positive. It's a good thing to check your blood pressure. Something simple. But you have to practice some ways of saying things that aren't in a question form. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do for your blood pressure? Well, your blood pressure seems to be pretty good. You're doing something. That's not a question, but it certainly opens, perhaps, some discussion about what else you're doing. And you will be amazed to find out how careful people are about things like their diet and their exercise and how much they want to be well, you know? Mm -hmm. Could you give me some examples of what it, uh, accompanied me in the journey? Oh, <laughs> this is a tricky one. It really is a tricky one because... You may think, and I've been taught this by people who came to the, to the uh, commons. Um, <laughs> uh, one fellow came and he was, uh, he was really in a bind in where he was living, in his living arrangement. And he really wanted, he was wondering if maybe I could write a letter that, you know, told about his work with the students and how he was a positive help to us at the Health Commons. And so I said, sure, I can do that. I can write you a letter. So I wrote the letter and I went to his living place, walk in the door, ask for him, hand him the letter and say, you know, if you want, I can come to the meeting because he was facing eviction or something. And he was very kind. He, he was just very polite and civil. And he said, no, that's okay, that's okay. I can manage it. And, you know, went to the door with me. The next time he came to the commons, he said, you know, you really don't need to do that for me. I come here because I want you to listen to me. That's where I get the help. Just listen to me. I'm not asking you to do anything for me. Okay. So accompaniment is offering the support, listening, believing, trusting, you know, and then if they want something, so I wrote the letter. What I made the, what I made the mistake was delivering the letter, showing up, you know, because I don't know what the social dynamics were in that setting, but me being there didn't help his situation. And you know what it's like. You go to the, you go to a uh, halfway house, uh, a drop-in center, usually or often, the staff there are on the defensive. Like, who are you? What are you doing here? Because clearly you're not here looking for a place to stay. So right away, are you some authority from some other place who are going to check me out? So it's a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. well, I think you've taken so many things that are so, that are happening in that space that are so complex and ambiguous and somehow made it into this rational model that makes sense and gives us purpose and words to use to describe what's happening there. How do you do that? How did you come up with what you came up with? I mean, you... Well, the, I, <laughs> you know, it was not hypothesis testing. There was no data collection involved. <laughs> I was just working it over in my brain, you know, drawing it out graphically, looking at that, thinking, what does that mean, you know, and then I really have in mind this idea of the, the rite of passage. I think the rite of passage is a helpful way to think about what happens in the, in the setting, coming from a formalized system into this ambiguity and then having to go back to the formal system. So I think it's a good 
and you can never change what happened in that little setting. You've been you have been changed somewhat. So I think that's a helpful, and that came to me. I think the the you know I listened honestly. I respected the students I was working with who said, "Oh, this is too linear." You know, that doesn't work. We need to have something that shows this is, you know, you kind of come into it in different places. It isn't just this stepwise thing. So it came up with, I think, a model that represents kind of the, uh, a, better, a better conceptualization of this as not a stepwise thing. The, the part of it that I feel very strongly about that I think is hard, especially for professionals to grasp, is recognizing how much they are getting from the people who come. So what was left out in this circle was the activity of the people who come. So if you take what I think is the most complex thing, the accompaniment, you only get to do accompaniment if you are invited. And you are only invited if you have gone through the other things and you have developed trust. When you are attending to need, you have to also recognize how much you're getting from people. You can fulfill a need. Holy smokes, you know, that feels good no matter who. I mean, that's why we're in the helping professions, right? Mm -hmm. So to see the mutuality and to see what people are actually giving to us. I'm sure you've had the experience where at the kind of, um, at the end of the day, going over debriefing with students, and they're just dismissive of what they have heard from people. They don't realize what it has taken to say, to tell people what they have told them about their lives. You know, I think it just, that was one of the things that was most frustrating to me with students, mm -hmm. that they just didn't recognize this was a great opportunity you had. That is a rare opportunity, a rare opportunity, you know? to have somebody speak honestly with you about this. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it would make me most mad when I would have people come for the immersion and students would sort of not see what they were hearing from this person. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that part of it, I think, needs to be emphasized as much as possible. I agree. So as far as when you were at the Health Commons, what, what was your favorite part of well, you know, just hanging out, just hanging out and talking to people. Hanging out and talking to people without any pressure of doing something to fix them, you know? I just am, an, I am I'm kind of a radical non-interventionist. So, and that's, it's not a good thing. I mean, we need people there who can kind of take charge and intervene when it's needed. And, and I've done that too. But um, I think I've also learned that you can kind of wait a little bit things kind of unfold and it looked like a giant emergency like when the couple came in and they wanted us to you know file a police report <clears throat> police brutality and he was all black and blue and you know we want they wanted our help and we said well you know well, well tell us more about it let's talk more about it well the more we talked about it the more it became clear that there was as much a domestic thing going on here and an opportunity that was being looked for, it started to feel like. So just take some time here, what looks like a big crisis, there's always more to it. It's more complex than it looks on the surface. So I'm a non-interventionist, so the fun was to be there and just hang out and talk to people. And in the nursing, in the health commons, it was easier than up in the community room. Up in the community room, one of the things I learned... You mean fellowship hall? I mean the fellowship hall. One of the things I learned from people who would talk to me outside of the setting, people living on the street, the, the dynamics among the people who come are really unrecognizable to us. But they are very active. So being up in the fellowship hall, I would guess who you sit with, where you sit, how you talk, who you talk to, is being watched. And it's being calculated in some way about what your role is here and who you're singling out and, you know, why are you so interested in that person. 
I just think it's because it's a bigger space. It's more there. There's more social stuff going on. I think it's easier in the health commons where it's a smaller space, fewer people, and there's sort of an expectation built up now that yeah, you know, they're going to listen. Mm -hmm. So for nurses who are caring for people who might be experiencing homelessness or who are marginally housed, what advice would you have for them? I, I heard, um, uh, let's see, um, I think it's, I'm trying to put together words, I think if they're from Wendell Berry, they're not my words, but it's, it's affectionate curiosity. In other words, you respect them, you're really interested, and you're interested for your own reasons too, but you're also interested because you care about them, and you care about what their, what their experience is. So, if, well, I guess, there's so many things that I want to ask you. Um, if there was one thing that you could change about healthcare after all that you learned through this, um, through your work at the Health Commons and in other settings, what would it be? What would you want to change? I'd rather talk about health and healthcare. You know, um, of course, the system could do better for a single payer and universal. But we're still a problem of, you know, money for this system that is, it's just a capitalist system that just sucks up money. It's just a black hole. I, you know, I don't think it works. My son and daughter-in-law just had a baby. Couldn't have been easier unless they did it at home in a bathtub. It cost them $16,500 which is just absurd. Now that's a big problem. And where is that money going? You know, so I think if we quit talking about health care and started talking about health and got pharmaceutical ads banned from television, banned. If you want to deal with the opioid addiction, get rid of pharmaceutical ads. I mean, I think that just gives people the idea, a pill will make me happy. It just takes a pill. Never mind that a pill that's all could be fatal. You will be happy. Mm -hmm. You'll have a happy life. You'll have a dog and kids and picnics. And so anyway, the, the, I don't know how you get the, the corporations out of the system or the capitalists out of the system. I think you. I think Minnesota had the right idea. Absolutely, with Minnesota Care, tax the places that are making the most money on this. Tax the professionals. Tax the healthcare delivery systems. You know, and of course they didn't like it, but they're making the most money off of it. Mm -hmm. So, as far as the health commons, what what do you think it should be like twenty years from now? Or look like. 20 years from now, I hope there aren't as many homeless people, but there's no doubt there will be. In fact, the way this country is going, <laughs> I just gave a guy a couple of dollars at the exit because he had a nasty <laughs> sign about the president. Um, okay, what do I think? 20 years, that's hard to think about. 20 well, years. or is there something right now? that you think that we should always remember moving forward, that maybe we should work on changing a little bit as it was, that it currently is. Okay, here's something that I have, I have noticed about nurses and nursing students. Um, they really don't believe in their own authority. They don't believe in what they have to offer. It's always this deferring, well, or referring, you need to, that you need to go to somebody who can really help you. To step up and say, we are helping, we can do this, we are doing this. And I think, you know, this project, to say, I don't have to do the model that is both the undergraduate fallback default, nor is it the, the natural sciences default. The natural sciences are limited. 
there's need, there's more to scholarship. So I think for scholars and you guys can do this to really shift scholarship into something that is connected to making a difference for people in their living situation, what, where, what they're people, people who are struggling. And that's a lot of people. Well, you're such a radical thinker and an excellent teacher, as you were my teacher, as well as Dr. Freeborgs. So what advice do you have for current faculty or future faculty in the department teaching transcultural nursing to teach it in a meaningful way? Well, hang on to the transcultural part of it. You know, I, I think we're lucky that we have um, students and faculty who, going into a nurse practitioner track, are still open to the transcultural concepts because I've always felt that's a real danger because of the power of the medical model to kind of broaden that and I know I don't I don't know how to get past that except to just believe in the value of understanding people's circumstances and the context and how that both relates to what what opportunities they have and to just keep pushing pushing that scholarship definition you know so that, that you will be pushed and pushed into that research model that is not useful for everything. It's not the only way to do things, you know. I, I refuse to do a survey. I refuse because I think the data you get out of a survey is just dangerous because it is used as if this hack is generalizable. This has given you some data that you can quantify. No, it hasn't. It's just limited the areas that you're asking questions about. You're not getting the information. You're getting a very limited portion of it. So anyway, I keep pushing that scholarship idea. Is there one story that you want to share of your like most memorable teaching experience or a moment at the Health Commons that was just something that you reflect on? Well, I've learned a great deal about the circumstances that people who come to the common space by accompanying them into the hospital and seeing the, 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 immediate, the immediate dynamics of suspicion and defensiveness that just gets exaggerated and built up and built up to something that's ridiculous. But there's so much control in that system. And it's and this was something that I learned in my, my doctoral work. It is structured for that control. It is structured like that. So um, what was the question? <laughs> it was just a story of a teaching experience that you... Well, I can't go into the experience without divulging, you know, people. So I'll just skip over that one. I mean, I've had experiences where I've just had... I keep going over and over just a terrible experience in a student. You know, a student where we had a... We had a person from the community come, and the student just contradicted the person's experience and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't, I just kind of freaked out. I didn't say anything which was absolutely the wrong thing but I couldn't figure out what to say. What to, I was so flabbergasted that somebody would be so disrespectful, you know. But they were from the same country, they had their own experience which was totally class different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've made some bad mistakes. Do you know what you would have done? Have I thought no, about what I yeah. would have done? I think I would have asked the, the guest to speak more about what she saw because the student clearly was not open to see it. And I, that's okay, but I want the other students to know what, that's, what that person experienced. And she, you know, it was... She was giving a sort of summary of things in her life, so she didn't go into it. I'm sorry, I didn't ask her to elaborate. Mm -hmm. 
So another key theoretical concept you established were the rules of thumb, thumb for nursing practice while engaging in marginalized settings. What can you tell me about the rules of thumb and how did you come up with them? Well, I would kind of hang this on to my idea about what nurses need to do and be more confident about what they know. This just came out of reflecting on my experience. Uh, my experience of my education and my experience with people. You know, that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. And of course you revise it and revise it, look at them and think what else could you add or what is too much, what is the wrong way to say this, what, you know. So you, it's just a draft and a draft and a draft and a redraft, but it's coming out of reflection on my own experience. And just trusting that there is some value in that. So when the first time I presented that model, and Sue Nash said to me, oh my gosh, when are you going to publish that? I thought, whoa. I, know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just expected, because it wasn't based on research, mm -hmm. that it somehow wasn't legitimate. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've had enough experience. If we reflect on it, mm -hmm. and reflect on it sincerely, not through the reference of, some other scholar or something, but just how, how do we put words on what we know? Mm -hmm. so that's what I did. Thanks to James Scott, who already had you know come up with the idea too of rules of thumb. But where did the accompaniment come from? Is that it? Oh, that that certainly wasn't mine. That's used in I think a number of places. But I like the idea. I thought that's that's really the that's really a lot of skill to be able to be at that position. Mm -hmm. Well, just because you always talk about the cultural guides and like the Oaxaca immersion and mm -hmm. really breaking bread together, so that always kind of reminded me of that. So I didn't know if it was a Gustavo thing or it, yeah, it could have been. You know, this kind of all this stuff kind of just. Mm -hmm. You, like, is there anything that isn't plagiarized? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Can I ask another question? Sure. Since we're on that topic, do you see the model morphing at all or changing or being applied in new ways? Or are there any hopes regarding its use or publications? <laughs> yeah, I can see. Absolutely. I would love to see it, you know, added to, developed more. I think one of the things that really struck me uh, in the um, evaluation book that I have, have been so dedicated and believe so firmly in local context, but the idea that you can be innovative in local context, but if it's going to really have impact, you've got to be able to bridge it to something that is going to get farther out there, you know? So um, I think it's, I, I worked at the university with a woman who would go on television and talk about it. Whoa, okay, there's a way to do it. You don't have to necessarily change what you're doing, but you have to be open to giving what you do a little publicity, you know? So if you can't do that, hook up with somebody who can, or, you know, because it has to reach a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to reach a wider, but that's an, a place where I think it could go. Mm -hmm. Not that it's going to be a replicable, that's not the point, but mm -hmm. it could help give people ideas about how to do things, mm -hmm. give other nurses a little confidence to get out of the medical model a little bit, mm -hmm. give people, I guess, you know, I just, that I think one of the things I used to like to tell students, and you see, I could go on and on, I used to like telling them, you know, you're not doing therapy here. That's a psychiatric model. And that's not our model. We are not psychiatrists, so get off that therapy idea. You don't have to do therapeutic communication. You don't have to say the right thing, you know? So, so you just, you're not, that's not your role. One thing I think that I always struggle with as a teacher that I think you excelled at so much is you often came in very 
unstructured. You didn't come in with a PowerPoint with a hidden agenda of what the outcomes are going to be. Um, you didn't over prepare. You came in, students read what you wanted them to read or watched what you assigned, and you shaped conversations in a very meaningful way mm-hmm. and allowed students to always feel not only heard, but what they had said had relevance to the conversation, even if other students were struggling to make that connection. So did you, I mean, did you have something in your mind that you always went back to, or was that just your natural skill? Well, that's very kind of you to say it. <laughs> I should come a little more prepared, but it never worked for me because I couldn't, I, I couldn't manipulate people into <laughs> a place. I wasn't that clever or strategic. But what I did, I mean, I picked readings, and I really wanted to go into those readings, and I would refresh myself about those readings so that when discussion happened, I could connect it to the reading because it was all fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. So I I would do that. And um, I, I, but I was, I mean, I can think of times when, you know, somebody just really criticized the book, the whole book, Mm -hmm. You know, just dismissed it completely, and I wasn't ready for it because, of course, I believe so firmly. In it. Oh, what's the matter with you that you can't see this? You know, so instead of saying something mean and nasty to the student, I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't have anything to say. But you know, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. I guess. I guess good students. That's where it came from. Actually, students who prepared and students who came and took it seriously and wanted wanted some discussion. And I know there were times when I couldn't stop people who monopolized conversation. I should have done a better job of that because I think that can be hard. Or draw out people who you know, were quiet in class and I knew there was so much going on in their mind. Good. Well, I think that's all the questions that I had for you, Dr. Freeborn. Do you have anything you want to ask? I do not. Is there any last, anything you want to tell us that we didn't ask about? No, oh, I think I talked way too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for this. Go this through is, the consent. Yep. This oh, is yeah, very yeah. rich and will be very meaningful for future generations to come. And it makes me want to even go back and do a whole another interview with you um, to hear more, especially about some of the stuff that along the lines of the transcultural, advanced practice transcultural nursing skills and things like Mm -hmm. that. But maybe that'll be a future segment. (laughs) Um, But as far as now that we're at the end, would you be comfortable doing the oral consent now? Sure. Okay. So all I need for the record is to make sure that you confirm that you consent to being interviewed and having the interview recorded and stored at Augsburg University, which we made available to the public. That's, yes, I consent. Okay. I do. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. (laughs)